Good morning, good morning from sunny Spokane. So last night we were kind of doing a test drive for this live feed this morning. And of course it was after the sun had set. So this morning when we came in here and it's really, really bright and sunny, all the light has changed. And you'll see when I sit down at my chair, I am in the bright, bright, bright sun. And we've messed around with the blinds on, off, and et cetera. And you're just going to get a bright sunny morning, let's just say. It is an absolutely gorgeous day outside. So I'm happy to see it. And I don't know that the, I don't know how it's going to affect our picture quality, but it is what it is. We're glad for the sun. I'm Susan Smith. You're in my studio, Stitched by Susan. Usually I'm long arming a project in these live episodes. And um, in general, I try to complete one from start to finish in the course of an episode so that you can see that quilting project in real time. But Lucy, my long arm, um, broke down last Tuesday. And so we spent the week troubleshooting and in consultation with our dealer and so forth and trying to figure out what's wrong and it's not altogether solved yet but hopefully parts are coming today and we'll be up and running again tomorrow fingers crossed. Meantime um, since we're used to doing these lives and getting together and I knew you'd be watching for something I decided that I would go ahead and bind the sundress quilt today. So if you were watching these live episodes about three weeks ago I think I did a series um, four days in a row or close to each other that were the custom quilting of this little sundress quilt. The pattern, by the way, is by Meg Hockey of Crabapple Hill. So they're hand embroidered sundress blocks and then there's piecing and a little bit of light appliqueing going on on the quilt as well. And so there were several days of quilting doing the custom work that is in this, the border, you know, the stitch in the ditch, all the things that are involved in a custom quilt. And all that's left now is to bind it. So that's what I'm going to be doing today. So much like my quilting episodes, um, it's not really a lesson. The cameras are not going to zoom in really closely. You're not going to get close up detail of how I'm doing it, but hopefully it will give you the big picture. So you'll be able to see how I do my binding. And Almost all of the time, I do 100% machine binding on my quilts. It's a huge time saver, and I've done enough of them and worked out my sort of method and seam allowances well enough that I can make it look really sharp and crisp. So I don't feel like it's an inferior product. So you'll get to see how I do that today. So let's get started. Um, maybe we'll take a minute and say hi to those that have joined in. If I can see the screen in the sun, I think I can. I'm ready. Hang on a second. Fiddling with the technical details here. Well, I'll grab my coffee. You know I've always got that right by my side. Let's get that in hand. Welcome. Laurel, good morning. Well, good morning to you too, Laurel. Got to take the glasses off to read the screen. And Joan, good morning. Let us know where you're watching from. It's always fascinating to me to see where people are tuning in from. Debbie Winter, hello and good morning. Jana, good morning, happy to be here. I'm so glad you are. Sue, good morning, Susan. There do seem to be a lot of Susans in these episodes somehow. <laughs> Sally, good morning from Indiana, welcome. Let us know if you're new. Yeah, let us know if you're new, um, if you haven't joined in before, and especially then, would you let me know where you learned about me from? Was it on Facebook? Was it a YouTube episode? Did a friend tell you? That kind of thing. Kind of helps me to know where to be reaching out to people. Jenny, good morning from Alaska. Looking forward to seeing your binding instruction. And Lisa, good morning from Wisconsin. Donna, good morning, Susan. Some of you ladies come every week, and I'm so glad you do. Another Susan, hello from New Hampshire. Any more? Kathy, good morning from beautiful, sunny eastern Washington. It is so sunny and gorgeous this morning, isn't it? Good morning from Calgary, Alberta. I know right where that is. And Joan from Thornton, Colorado. Laurel is Minnesota on the Canadian border. Oh, you're way up there north. Nice. Deb from Annandale, Virginia. Welcome. Stacy from Minnesota. See, this is so fun to see people from all over the continent, not just the country, joining in. Good morning from Central Oregon, Jenny. Good, and Deb, we have rain here in Virginia. Well, that's not a bad thing in the spring, is it? Good morning from Florida. I bet you the weather's gorgeous there. And Lauren from Grand Bend, Ontario. Grand Bend, yeah. hard to read, Ontario. 
in case you haven't heard me say it before, I'm a Canadian too, and in fact, I was born in southern Ontario. So yeah. All right, well, welcome. Bonnie, I love your videos. I've learned so much. Good. I hope, my hope is that they're helpful really in getting that big picture of what quilt making looks like. They're not always focused in on the teeny tiny details, and I do have some tutorials that do that, and other quilters do too. But I just felt like there was a lack in the quilting world of videos where you could just see in real time quilters, you know, doing their thing, solving their problems. So that's kind of what this is about. Sally, I've been stalking you live and unscripted for many weeks and brand new to long, to long arm quilting. Yes, nice. Well, I'm glad you found us. And Laura, hello and welcome. Laura's name I've seen lots of times. Okay, let's get started. I have already cut my binding strips. My personal preference is a two and a quarter inch width. Some people prefer two and a half or maybe even a little wider. And the odd person prefers two inch, which is a very tiny narrow binding. So I've done mine at two and a quarter. So I'm just going to go ahead and sew my strips together end to end. And here's where you're going to see the beautiful sunshine on my face right here. <laughs> so I do sew my strips together with a, I don't know if mitered is the right term, but a slanted seam. And the reason I do this is so that my seam allowance has much less bulk. If I were to sew a straight seam, and press it open and then do my folds around the quilt, I would get a very bulky area where that seam is. So when I have a slanted seam, that just disperses all that bulk. I'm supposed to look at this comment. Hello from Greece. Oh, awesome. That's fantastic that you're watching from the other side of the world. Welcome. I guess I'll make jealous. I can hardly read the screen. Hello from North Central Texas. Hope to catch it all. Keeping my three little granddaughters today. Oh, and my husband is behind the camera saying, this one will make you jealous, and here's why. We have one little granddaughter, and she lives in Canada. And I last saw her when she was about three weeks old, and now she's 15 months, because I can't cross the border and visit her. So that is very sad, and I am indeed jealous. But back to quilt making. So I'm doing one extra thing on here that I don't know that you'll be able to see necessarily on camera, but my binding has this stripe. It's a little larger than an eighth of an inch, and I do want my stripes to match in my seams. There's my stripe. A little larger than an eighth of an inch diagonal stripe. So this is not cut on the bias, as you can see. The, the striping is on the slant, and so I was able to cut on the straight of grain. So I'm just taking the time to pin those stripes matching up, green to green and white to white, where my little seam is going to be. Just one pin at the top and one at the bottom. And of course, because I'm talking and not really thinking, I have to sew this on the slant to get the slanted seam that I was speaking of, don't I? So my pins are still in place. I'm just going to shift them to be where I'm going to be sewing. And I'm going to shift my stripes until they match up right at the edge of the fabric, right where I want to start my seam. And basically, I don't have to do any marking or any pressing of my 45 degree angle, right? Because the stripe is my sewing line. And of course, I'm a short cutter, so I wouldn't be drawing a line there anyways. But lots of quilt makers do. I don't think I've done a binding episode like this before. And it's funny, I've done so many quilt making ones now that I can kind of do it without thinking. I'm not so sure that's true about the binding. That looks pretty good, except I've learned one thing. When I'm matching my stripes, I need to not match green to green and white to white, but the other way around, so that when I open my seam, they alternate. So I'm going to lay a green stripe on a white stripe. Does that make sense? If you do what I just did and try one seam out, you'll see it happen. I might, while I do this, just talk for a second about how I, <clears throat> how I calculate my binding um, length, how much I need to cut. So I do cut my binding strips across the width of fabric. So my working assumption is that I will get about 42 inches from each cut. So I measured the perimeter of my quilt, 
and I can't now remember those numbers for you, so I'm going to kind of make up numbers. Let's say the quilt is 50 inches on each side. And so I would say I have four sides to the quilt. That's 200. And I add 10 inches of sort of extra for, for turning corners and things like that. And just, just a wee bit extra joining the ends. And so then I've got 210 inches that I need of total binding. So I divide that by the 42 inches that I will get out of each strip. And that tells me how many strips of binding to cut. So this particular quilt is 64 inches on each side. I can't remember the total number now. I guess that would be 128, so 256. There's some mental math for you right on camera. Anyway, just did the same process. Took the entire perimeter plus 10 inches divided by 42 usable inches per strip. And I arrived at six inches each, or sorry, six strips. And more frequently, I don't even cut my thread between the seam allowances. I just do one right after another and snip them all apart later. So I'm curious, while I do this, are you all sewing on things this morning in your studio too? Or are you sneaking a screen under your desk while you're working? In case anybody's wondering, I'm sewing on a Baby Lock Symphony. Um, I purchased this machine a number of years ago. It, is, it has proven to be a workhorse for me. I have sewn many, many, many miles on it. Um, what I loved about it was this large table. You can see the surface that I'm working on. And I don't have a dedicated, um, you know, specifically sewing table in my studio. So whatever surface I use then, it doesn't really matter. This, this white surface becomes my working area. And I really have liked this machine. And I think that's all of them. So now I go back, and maybe I'll go to the ironing board so you can see a little easier, because I think the machine in the bright sun is so, so difficult. So I'm just taking each corner. So here's my seam now. Right, you can see that I sewed on the 45 degree angle. It's not really too far away. Come forward if you want. I can't come forward very much, Dave, to show that. And all I'm going to do is trim off the excess edges and trim that seam to a quarter inch. so that now when I press my seam open, I'll just have a nice join right there. Are we hearing from people what they're working on this morning? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'll be fully honest with you guys, my stripes didn't all come together perfectly as I wanted them to. But at least I don't have any quarter inch wide green blobs that would really kind of catch the eye. So I'm satisfied. I bet you figured out by now that I'm kind of a, I do like things to be neat, but I'm not really a perfectionist when it comes to my quilts. Good enough is good enough. Let's make sure the iron is on. Okay, here's a funny story for you guys. I usually keep a pin in my ironing board just for binding, and I'm going to step out of the camera and get one. Dave's been using my ironing board for his recording table, so it got cleaned up by the look of it. Don't know that you can see this on camera, but I bet you'll be able to figure it out. I have a corsage pin from my quilting, a heavy-duty pin, and I take a tiny stitch in my ironing board. Then I fold my binding in half, 
slide it under the tip of that pin so that the pin goes right over the top of it. And really snugly after the end of that binding, I take another stitch into my ironing board and the, the batting that's underneath it. So basically I've got a channel exactly the width of that binding. And I've done it within a few inches of the edge of my ironing board. And then you're going to see some efficiency happen. But let's take a second and iron these seams open. Now that the iron's hot. I do iron my seams open always in the binding. Again, just with, <coughs> excuse me, in the interest of reducing the bulk of those seams. You'll get the smoothest look on your binding if you don't have, uh, you know, bulky knobs where the seam allowances are. So putting them at a 45 degree angle is the first big step and pressing them open helps as well. One more. Okay, so now I come back down to where my pin is. I'm going to get a nice good crease going on on the left hand side there. And now I'm going to pull my binding through under that pin. I need to get it a little tighter. Give me a second. And the channel that that pin has created causes my fabric to fold in half and I can keep ironing on the far side of the pin and pulling it through. I will tell you it's not perfect like a machine. I do have to often keep adjusting watching that my fold that's under the pin you know is equal. It is in fact folding in half but it is still far faster than doing it manually. You know folding it over with your fingertips, pressing, folding it over with your fingertips, etc. Isn't that slick? Do I have a picture of this anywhere on Pinterest? I know I did a little tutorial on um, Instagram for those of you that are on it, you know the little IGTV channels. I did a little tutorial on there that was much more close up and you could see it better. Um, of course my camera is doing the recording of this right now so I can't take photographs while I'm doing it. But mentioning cameras reminds me, I've talked to you guys the last couple weeks about buymeacoffee.com, which is kind of a fun way that viewers are able to support what I'm doing and just make little one-time donations. And Dave will pop the link up on the screen. And you guys have responded, and I am so grateful. I, my goal at the beginning was that I wanted to aim for getting another camera. We want one that has better depth of focus on what I'm doing at the quilting machine and that doesn't have as many cords and wires that are attached so that my movement becomes a little freer. So we are over a third of the way to our goal of a camera. I am so tickled and pleased and thank you all for that. So basically I'm just going to keep on going till I get to the end of my binding. And as I said, you know, I keep having to adjust and fiddle with the fabric a little bit to keep it accurate. Um, but it is still so much quicker than doing every little fold manually. Once again, I'm going to adjust my pin just a little tighter. So all that pin does is it just has a little stitch right before the binding and a little stitch right after the binding. In the course of the quilting process, um, we did some talking on the last day about what to bind this quilt with. And I debated over the green and white stripe. The green matches the quilt beautifully, but I wasn't sure how I felt about the green against the backing, which is the very corally and pinky um, tulip pink polka dots. 
but most of you all calmed my jitters about that and said, just go for it. So that's what I'm doing. I do absolutely love a striped binding, so that was an influencer for sure. Whenever I'm going over the seam allowances, it does take a little bit of babying to get that smoothly under the pin. Different fabrics respond a bit differently to this too. There are some that seem to have so much give that they just won't feed smoothly and crisply under there. But most quilting cottons, I've had good success with this little cheat. And just like that, our binding is all pressed and it is accurate, like within a thread or two, those folds. Any comments so far? Um, sure, I'll take a few comments. Have a bunch. And I'll get a sip of coffee. Are you able to raise them, Dave? I'm yeah. not able to read them against the background. Okay, Marty, green is a complementary color for red, so it will look great. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Jenny, flowers in nature are green and pink, hot pink even. If it happens in nature, it can happen on a quilt, right? Yes, indeed. I'm agreeing. Donna, how did you make your ironing board? Oh, that's another aside point. It is just a piece of plywood with one layer of batting over it and one layer of fabric over it, and I've stapled it underneath. And it's just sitting on top of a traditional ironing board, and I've just got a little, um, on all four sides, there's just a little wooden slat that keeps it from sliding, although honestly, it doesn't ever slide on me. Um, that's almost a topic for another day. I love my square ironing board for quilting. This is bigger than it would have to be, but the squareness and the straight lines to work with making quilts and straight seams, top notch. Laura, what iron do you have? It is a Shark um, Professional 1500 watts. So it's not the super high powered ones. They do come more than 1500, but it's more than the traditional, like just clothing iron for your home. Charlene, if you put another pin farther down on the table, it's easier yet. Aha! I will try that. Thank you for that tip. I don't know what this so is. I assume you mean further out so that it's kind of feeding through one to get the general fold and then the second one kind of fine tunes it. I don't know what that was Laura, I love you. that. I'm not sure what you're loving, but I'm glad. <laughs> okay. So you're asking what everybody was doing? Oh, okay. I'm working. Now we're talking about what everyone's yep. doing. We're working upwards on the comments. Sam, listening to Bob Ross of Quilting While I Work. I'm so glad that name is, yeah, sticking. Um, by the way, for those of you who are listening, a number of you have listened to and commented on my podcast. So Sam Alberts will be the next guest. So this Wednesday, the episode that's releasing has Sam as my guest. Deb, working on a queen size custom quilt for a customer. Nice. Charlene, I'm sewing a GE Design strip along at the moment. And Jenny, watching on my phone from work, Facebook needs a little mute button on lives. Yeah, doesn't it? And Sally, working on my fifth quilt of valor for the year. Nice. I've got one to quilt in my lineup here shortly. Stacy, watching while I work my day job. Mm-hmm. Day jobs get in the way, don't they? Jana, going down to my long arm. Excellent. And Laura, making a quilt for my husband. Oh, that's nice. Maureen, working and listening. So lots of you are working at other things, which is wonderful. That's, it's the perfect uh, blend because, you know, because I'm not really teaching a focused lesson, you can just kind of have this going in the background and pick up tips where you will. 
Jeannie, hi Susan, I'm in Canada, daughter's in UK and South Carolina. Like you, it's been 15 months. Yeah, it's getting rough, tell ya. Any more? Oh, yeah. oh, Joan, hardly ever do I find a striped fabric that I can resist buying for binding. Have a cabinet full. Oh, I envy you. I, I don't. But I do have a few. And now that I know that I love them, I'll be like you and start stockpiling them. We'll Laurel, after. can you show a close-up of your pins you run the binding through? Either we'll bring a camera over and do a close-up, Laura, or after we're done filming, I'll snap some pictures and post them on my Facebook page so you can come back and find them. Jana, love your binding choice. Good. Thank you. And that's it for comments. Okay, so I have another fun tip for you. I'm going to wrap my binding around my hand. Um, I'm kind of spreading my four fingers and making just, I just want it to be round. And I will show you why in a second. If you have a really long binding, this can get in a tangle on the floor. I don't have a, a good fix for that, but this is not a particularly massive binding. So I just let the twists untwist. Get it all wound up. So if, if you're willing, would you like and share the post this morning in case you've got other friends that you think might be interested in this? These episodes are always reviewable, um, replayable on Facebook. Okay, here's my big tip, and I should say that more better. If you like and share these posts, people can come back and rewatch them. They're replayable and it will be uploaded to YouTube within a day or two as well. So I would appreciate if you would share them. And I think I mentioned last week and a couple of you did it and I appreciate it. If you will consider doing a review on my Facebook page, that gives me a, you know, out of five stars kind of rating. And up until last week, I did not have a single one. So it didn't give me any rating at all which is not very nice. So I would appreciate if a couple of you would give me a rating on there and be honest. Okay, here's the tip. Old thread cone, drop the binding over it. When I go to sew it on my quilt, I'm gonna be doing it this way so it feeds like this. I'm going to put this cone kind of between my thighs, between right behind my knees as I'm sewing and this will just unspool under my sewing machine. How genius is that? And that is not original to me, but I can't for the life of me remember who gave me that tip. No, that's a, I'm but not to fix this if I... anything would work. I mean, toilet paper roll, anything that will, you know, this just stays fixed between your, just right behind the caps of your knees. But this unspools and it keeps it from getting tangled and keeps it from fraying and getting knotted up on the floor. So that's my binding, ready to go. I think we're all set back into the sunshine. Alrighty, here's another tip. I don't know if this one will show on the camera. Does it show, Dave? I'm working on a desk, a wooden desk. And when I'm working on binding, I need space like to hold the quilt up so it's not always pulling and tugging at my stitching. So this is my faux extension. I just pull the drawer out to its furthest extent and that gives more area for my quilt to rest upon. So here comes the quilt. Because I am doing this 100% by machine, my method is to sew the binding on the back, bring it round to the front, and do the top stitching from the front side so that my top stitching falls just off the binding on the back. Does that make sense? And you'll kind of see it as I go. But I'm gonna line up my quilt now so that I'm applying the binding to the back side of it. And it doesn't really matter where you start, although you need a little bit of room to work with your seam when you're joining the ends after you've made your full round around the quilt. So I will not start right at a corner, but anywhere else is fine. Okay, get my little binding all set up, which you guys can't see, but it's just propped right behind my knees, and now I can just pull it freely. I leave a tail of about eight inches or so for doing my joining up after I've lapped the quilt. So I'm gonna start stitching right about here on my quilt top. And in terms of seam allowance, it's something that you want to experiment with. This is kind of what I was referring to when I said I've done so many, I've got these all worked out um, so that I get my seam allowance, I get my fold and around the front and I top stitch and that top stitching falls where I want it to be on the back. That takes a little experimentation with the seam allowance, but you want it basically to be a little less than a third the width of your finished binding. So in my case, 
It's a slightly generous quarter inch. You can try to. I don't know how well this will show on camera because as you can imagine, it's just a bit bulky and unwieldy handling the quilt. I'll do the best I can or Dave will to keep it clear for you. And because of the sun, I totally cannot see my screen on my computer. I'm stitching it at a 3.0 stitch length, so that would be three millimeters. So it's fine, but not as fine as I use for piecing. You don't even need to lock stitch at the beginning because I'll be lapping around and stitching over it again at the end. So I'm just lining up the edge of my binding with the edge of my quilt. And for those of you who watched me quilting it, you know that it's got a basting stitch all the way around it at a little less than a quarter inch. So since I'm doing this row of stitching at a little more than a quarter inch, I know that none of that basting will show. And the other thing I'm doing, and this is just from personal experience, my binding here, I'm putting just a little tension on as it feeds into my sewing machine. I find if I don't do that, then my finished quilt has slightly wavy binding, where the binding looks a little bit larger than the quilt, especially after a quilt has been washed and has done its little two or three percent of shrinking. So to circumvent that, I just put a little tension on my binding as I sew. And the binding is not super stretchy because it's cut on, this, on the cross grain of your fabric, but it has a little bit of give. So I just put that little bit of tension on it. And I'm coming to a corner here, and I am going to sew mitered corners, but you're not going to be able to see this on camera. But I will tell you this. One of the first ever YouTube videos that I made was actually doing machine binding. So if you search back in the archives, oh, probably a year or more ago, um, I do have a video that shows some of those close-ups of how I miter these corners and turn them and get them to be nice and square. And this quilt is particularly bulky and, and heavy because it has the double batting, remember? So it takes a little bit of maneuvering, and I'm sorry if it gets in the way of the camera, but we'll do the best we can. The other tool that I like to use is my seam ripper. I find that if I just let my machine go down the binding, it ends up pushing that top layer just a little, and I end up getting funny twists or puckers. So almost all the time when I'm sewing binding, I put my little tension on, I you know finger pin it down, and then I feed that binding under my presser foot using my seam ripper basically as a stylus to be just tucking that under the presser foot so that it can't push out in front. Those are little things, but kind of all put together, they help the thing to go on smoothly and crisply. And I'm sorry if this is noisy on the mic. I find that I have to keep readjusting a quilt so that it's not anywhere pulling because it's impossible to stitch a straight line if the quilt is, you know, yawing off to the left. So I keep shifting the weight of the quilt so that it is not at all pulling on my needle. I can stitch freely. And we're just going to continue stitching all the way around. I'm just using 100% cotton thread, the same type of thread that I use for piecing. You're getting a pretty good look at the back of the quilt. It's probably not close enough to actually see the quilting. It looks pretty fun on the back though, I'll tell you.
I just saw a three inch thread stitched right into the quilting, so I've just pulled it out. Notice how nicely my binding feeds. I don't ever have to think about it. It's never a tangle. I never have to stop and untwist it, detangle it. Those brief moments of untwisting that I did as I was winding it around my hand is all that I have to fiddle with it. And after that, it just feeds out smooth as anything. So I got a little tip from another quilter which is to cut just a little corner, a little 45 degree angled corner, you probably can't even see it, off the tip of my quilt. And I don't do all the layers, I just do the backing and the batting. I want some layers in there because I want that corner to feel full, not empty, but I don't want that corner to feel hard and stuffed. Does that make sense? So for me, that's a good middle ground, is just taking a small, partial tip. It's not in as far as the seam allowance even. It's just a little, a little ear nipped off that corner. And that helps my corners to lay flat. Again, something that you could experiment with, how much to cut to get the look and feel that you want in your corners. Come back here. Every time I see a thread, I'm just clipping it because I won't remember where they are. Okay, Dave's saying there are some questions, so let's take those for a second so I can talk while I'm stitching. Monica, have you attached the binding with the long arm? I have, Monica. I don't t typically do that on my own quilts because that involves attaching the binding to the front of the quilts. I do it for clients and then they flip it around to the back and hand stitch it. So short answer is yes, I have, but I don't usually on my own quilts. Sally, I put mine on a dowel and use some binder clips on the edge of my table to hold it. Yep, same process. You're, you're a problem solver. I see it. <laughs> yes, so helpful. Okay, another sip of coffee going down. Whoops, didn't realize I didn't have my needle in the quilt and I just pulled it out from under. Get my little mitered corner done again. Here again, because my quilt is very thick, I've used my little stylus to just encourage it to get going under the presser foot and not to novel up when I'm beginning, because it is very thick and, and bulky at the beginning of that seam. So I just take my time. Just take my time. Accuracy here does matter. The more accurately your binding is folded, the more accurate that your seam allowances are, the smoother that you stitch it down, the better crisp and neat binding result you're going to get. If you have not done much machine binding, I encourage you at some point to let two or three quilts uh, pile up and then do several, one right after another, and I think you'll find that you'll really get the hang of it, and it will kind of solidify in your mind the processes for the corners and the size of seam allowance you should take at your machine and all those things. That's what I found, is when I started doing several bindings back to back, I was like, oh yeah, these are getting neater and neater every time. And now I do it quite a lot, actually, for my clients. I have a number that ask me to just fully bind their quilts, and then they're just done.
coming up on my corner, so I'm just going to stop and nip a little of that batting fullness out of there. So if someone has a question, I guess, about how I'm doing the corners, can you please explain how you do the corners? Also, are you using a walking foot? I'm not using a walking foot. My machine is pretty good at feeding things through smoothly. I know lots of people who do and swear by it. Try it out by all means. I think I'm going to recommend, Cindy, the best way to see how I do the corner is to find my YouTube video on machine binding. If you search for that on my channel, which is Stitched by Susan on YouTube. I have some really good close-up shots in there of exactly how I do that. Um, I even have, if you're a Pinterest user and not a YouTube user, I think I have a, um, they call them a story pin, so it's kind of like a series of photographs and descriptions. I have one there as well on binding. We just don't have the camera capability this morning to get in close to where I'm working and get a good shot for you. I can tell you as I'm doing it, and maybe that will be enough for you. So I'm sewing along my binding edge, and I stop stitching exactly my seam allowance, seam allowance width away. So I'm stitching down this side, and I stop a seam allowance width away from this end here. So basically right in the corner, the seam allowance distance in. I stop right there, and I pivot my quilt a little bit and just stitch right off the corner. You don't have to, but that kind of anchors those threads. My quilt is going to slide and fall. Cut the thread, turn the whole mess, and I'll do it out here where you can see a bit. Oh, Dave's moved the camera. So I fold the binding straight up. Can you see that? So that it is lined right up with the edge of my quilt. This line right here is nice and straight. Then I just do it with my fingernail, but you certainly could put a pin right where the edge of your quilt is underneath there and fold it back. And now you have created a 45 inch seam allowance. So some of the photographs on my other tutorials will show you really clearly how precisely you do this makes a huge difference in how crisp and flat that corner is. So you don't want the fold to extend out beyond at all, and you don't want it to be shorter at all. You want it to be right there at the edge of the quilt. Likewise, this binding edge should match up exactly with the side of the quilt. And if you've done all that and you keep your seam allowance consistent this way and this way, you'll have a pretty nice crisp corner. And after I get this all sewn, I will of course show you how I turn that around then to the front and top stitch it and you get a 45 degree mitered corner, both front and back of the quilt. When it's all said and done. And I've just gotta shift this, it's just pulling. Okay, we have another question. Donna is asking, I also see my, sew my binding on this way, but I can never get the stitching to look nice in the reverse side. Any suggestions? I will give you some suggestions when I come to doing that, absolutely. Mr. Producer is telling me that this new camera angle is showing the stitching much better. So good, if we've improved that, yay. And you can see that I'm taking my time a little bit to do this. I've said it already once or twice, but I'll say it again. Every bit of accuracy and neatness that you strive toward here, that all contributes to the neat binding at the end. And I think, Donna, this is part of getting the stitching to look nice when you top stitch it as well, having a consistent seam allowance width here and therefore having a consistent binding width, you know, after it's folded around the quilt, all that comes into play. You can imagine if this seam allowance wobbles a little bit, you know, a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch here and there, and then that is exacerbated when I roll the binding around to the front of the quilt, and if that's not straight, then there's just no way to have a nice, neat, 
um, top stitching. I know that's kind of rambling, but you, you get the gist of it. It really matters, I think, when you're applying binding that you be quite consistent about it. And just slow down till you, till you can get it. Okay, there's another comment. Sally, after you make the turn, do you start stitching right at the edge of the quilt or do you start in or down the seam width? I start right at the edge of the quilt. I start right back in on the edge. That's kind of why I have to use my stylus to encourage it through. Um, that's a bulky bit going under the presser foot and it doesn't want to start easily, but I do start right at the edge. This is a bit of an arm and shoulder workout. Good thing it's not a very big quilt. You can see I'm just kind of alternating, trying all these different ways, putting a little tug on the back, using my stylus, whatever I've got to do to keep it going straight in under there. What was that, Dave? Well, it is a seam ripper, but I'm using it as a stylus, so that's why I keep calling it that. There is an actual sewing tool called a stylus that's just for this, but why have another tool? This one's always right here. Of course it's right here. As a little side note, growing up my mother did a lot of sewing too and I learned to sew from her. And I still have the seam ripper that she had when I was a child and it was one of those kind that had a seam ripper on one end and then you could, you could reverse it within its handle and it had a little tiny buttonhole ripper on the other end. Okay, well the moral to this story, which I did not realize through all of my growing up years sewing and using that one single seam ripper they dull and they're hard to use when they're dull. <laughs> so I still have it because it's just kind of that reminder to myself that frugal as I am, I'm not so frugal that I use the same tool for 20 years. Change your seam ripper out and if in doubt, get a new one and try it and see how much more smoothly it works. Like when I have a sharp seam ripper and this is just the Dritz, very ordinary variety, I can undo a seam just by sliding it along. I don't have to pick two threads at a time or anything like that. And uh, yeah, seriously, I do have that little one of my mom's and it is not even as sharp as a butter knife, I tell you, it's ridiculous. <laughs> so don't be that frugal, is what I'm saying. Have good tools. Appropriate and well-made tools just make the job so much easier. I buy these little Dritz guys. They do happen to be my favorite, the little blue Dritz ones. I buy them several at a time and I do just that. Every so often I pull out a new one and if there's a real difference in how it feels and how it works, I'm like, okay, that other one's old, turf it. So once again, I sewed, if you can see, Here's my quarter inch seam allowance. I sewed along here until I was a quarter inch from this edge of the quilt, right in that seam allowance point there. And then I just stitched off the end just to anchor those threads a bit. So now I can fold my fabric back against that stitching, lining up this line really nice and straight. Can't overemphasize that, that this does not tilt to one side or to the other. Get it really nice and straight. And then a really crisp fold back. Get it close to me so I can see it. Perfect. Manhandle the quilt a little bit. Sorry if it's bumping the microphone, I just can't help it. 
and again start stitching right at that edge. Use my seam ripper to encourage it to go, get started. And the walking foot probably would help there. Um, some machines have them built in, some machines it's easy to change them. On my machine it's a bit of a pain to put one on, so I've just learned to do my bindings without it. But that's just personal preference. I know there are people who swear by them. And if you're not familiar with the walking foot, um, your machine has built-in feed dogs, which are the rough places that encourage the fabric to move through. And a walking foot just has a similar device on the top so that both layers are being fed at the same time instead of just your bottom layer being fed and the top sometimes not going as smoothly. So lots of people do swear by them for doing binding because it gets all those layers to get under the presser foot simultaneously. I find my machine does a pretty decent job of it just as is. I believe we are on the last side if I haven't lost track. Oh yes, we are. When I've got the quilt laying here just right, I get an area where I can just zip along, but most of the time I'm going slowly because as I shift the quilt through, I can feel it's pushing or pulling a little, so I'm just taking it easy. And if you don't have as large a working surface as this, what I've done sometimes is um, bring my ironing board over here and just lower it to the height of my sewing machine table or even my desk. Just And you can set it behind, on the side, whatever way is convenient for you. Just again, to have something that will hold up all this bulky weight. It's impossible to put a binding on straight if that whole quilt is bearing down on your sewing. It's impossible to keep a nice even seam. That is probably my number one tip for applying binding. You can't fight with the weight of it. You've got to manage the weight of the quilt. That's the first step. Okay, you guys, this is going to be funny. Wait till I get to the end here. You're going to see how close my binding is. So I was just fixing to say, look ahead and be ready to leave a six or eight inch tail of unstitched binding. So here's the end of my binding. I'm going to break my thread and show you. Here's the edge of my binding. Here's my beginning. I have about uh, two or maybe two and a half inches to spare. That's pretty exact. I'm glad it didn't go the other way and I was two and a half inches short. <laughs> okay, so this will make it easy to talk about how we join these ends. Sure, let's take some comments. Oh, Yvonne, welcome. I'm heading to my sewing room to bind a quilt and you're going with me. I attach my bindings the same way you do. Nice. And Donna, I strive for my top stitching to be on the edge of the binding on the back side. Hard to explain. No, I know what you mean. And I think in my early machine um, binding application, I did that too. I made the top stitching, you know, land on the binding on the back. I couldn't keep it even enough to look good. So I'll show you what I do in just a few minutes. And to me, it was a good workaround, a good solution. Keep my thread cone for later. More comments. Jenna, love your binding choice. Good. Laurel, I haven't tried it, but someone said that you can use an emery board to sharpen a seam ripper. That would certainly be worth a try, absolutely. Joan, Susan, you should try a Kai seam ripper. You know, I've heard rave reviews about their scissors, and you know, I might just do that. Thanks for the recommendation, I, I'll give that a try. Cindy, I second that the Kai seam ripper is the best. Okay, I'm gonna give it a try. I do love a good tool. I don't, 
I do like to be frugal, but I don't want to be frugal to the point of being cheap. This is what I do for a living, and I want good tools because it makes working so much more pleasurable, doesn't it? Okay, back to our binding. Does this show on the camera? Do you hear what I'm working on? Because I'm going to do a little measuring and snipping. Maybe you want to just shift it a bit. We're just going to adjust cameras here, guys. Sorry about talking off, off camera, so to speak. Just so you can see this, because this is rather important. Got it? So I, this is my ending, where I've been sewing, coming here. This was my beginning flap that I left unstitched. So I'm going to first trim off um, the selvage and any of the little, you know, holes that are often in that end. I want only usable fabric on this top piece here. Get rid of that. And now, again, I'm going to put the same kind of pressure on it that I've been pressing, putting on my binding as I've been applying it. I'm going to put that same little bit of tension and pin it in place. You don't have to pin, I just find this keeps anything from shifting on me. I'm going to take my binding from the other end, again put the same amount of pressure. I just, I want to be able to see this edge here, so I'm just going to lift, put it in a little ways. Does that make sense? I know if you're just listening, it's not going to make any sense at all, but if you're watching, hopefully it will. So a little bit of tension, lay it down where I can see the overlapping area of the binding and pin it again close to the other one. Now, I want to trim so that the difference between this end and my overlap, this overlap needs to be exactly the same width as my cut binding was. So whatever you cut your binding, that's what this will be. I cut my binding two and a quarter inches in full width, so my overlap will be two and a quarter. If you cut your binding two and a half inches wide, your overlap will be two and a half. And if you have a long tail of extra binding, Often I'll just open that out and lay it over top and use that as my measurement. That's an easy way to do it, but because I just don't have enough tails today, brought out the ruler. So two and a quarter inches. So I'm measuring from my bottom, measuring how much overlap, getting awkward around my sewing machine, and just snipping that off. And that, folks, is how much excess binding I had. Right there. <laughs> I'm so glad I had enough. Dave was on the other camera. Okay, I'm going to show you again because it's just so funny. That's how much excess binding I had right there. Okay, now I open, and it doesn't really matter which one you do first, but I always open the one closest to me onto my sewing machine, open the one above it, so that they cross each other at the same kind of 45 degree angle that your early seams did when you were sewing your binding together. And you kind of have to pull your quilt up and put a pleat in that unstitched area so you've got some wiggle room. So there's my bottom one, here's my top one. And you can't really match up the stripes. You're, you're set with where the cuts are. And I pin it. I just line up all those straight edges to each other. There are certainly other ways. There are rulers that are made for this. You can press in or mark in a 45 degree angle up to you. This is how I do it. I pin it because I'm going to be sewing this way. So I pin at this end. I line everything up nicely and I pin at the other end. Now again, you could certainly draw a line across here from corner to corner. That's where you're going to stitch, me being me. I eyeball it. I've done so many of these, I, I eyeball it, but it is pretty accurate. So manhandle that quilt to try and get it as free as you can, you know, so it's not pulling. And I'm going to just stitch, and I'm going to shorten up my stitch length just a little, back to what I would use for piecing. And I'm going to stitch from corner to corner of that binding, and my quilt is just wanting to pull just a quarter inch. Again, that is the first step, though, to accuracy. Don't proceed until you've got that quilt managed. Even if you have to call in the troops to say, hold it up. Yeah, where's the cat when I need him? Hold my quilt up, buddy. So, just going to stitch across from corner to corner. Taking my pins out as I go. Okay. 
and then I do the check. I pull it open and I see, did I get it right? Because I have managed to twist that seam and have a funny little knobbly here before. But no, it is indeed right. It's not too tight. It's not too loose. It's perfect, like Mary Poppins. So then I just pull my quilt in a little bit again and trim that seam allowance down to a quarter inch. I don't take it to the ironing board. I just open it and press it with my thumbnails a little bit. I think this is my day to buy a lottery ticket because not only did I have just enough binding, but my stripes match exactly. I'm sure you can't see it, but like, look at those. Whoop. It's an awkward angle, but look at those stripes. They perfectly match. So I get that little seam allowance kind of pressed. Make sure that it's not um, twisted anywhere in there and fold that binding closed. And we're ready now to just overlap our stitching at the beginning and the end. Stitch it all in place and our binding will be attached. This is definitely not the easiest quilt in the world to work with. It is so heavy. So thick too. Dave says it's going to be a beautiful sleep on Sunday afternoon quilt. I have bad news for him. This is not going to be a sleep on Sunday afternoon quilt. No, no. So I have not really lock stitched. You might have noticed that. I just overlapped my previous stitching by a good half inch. And I still have my short seam allowance on, so I'm pretty confident that is not going anywhere. So now if you recall when we attached our binding pieces end to end when we began they all had 45 degree angled seams and now so does this finishing join and I defy anyone to take a look at this quilt with a magnifying glass and determine where I began and ended the binding. It's not seamless obviously it has seams but it is uh, smooth there is no obvious join. And again, I'm just overlapping my previous stitching. This time I will do a couple lock stitches just to show you that works too. Cut the threads and it's attached. Yay. Okay, next step, I'm gonna push in the faux drawer for a moment so I can get out of here. The faux table extension. This is a step that I do not see everyone doing on their binding, but I think it's critical again toward getting a really good crisp result and that is I iron my binding. So I'm just going to lay this up the same way that I was stitching, press my binding out and press that seam. And I don't like to press my quilts so as much as I can I try to limit my pressing to the binding and not be steaming and ironing my quilt surface. You can't avoid it altogether but that's my goal. Iron's pretty hot, good deal. So I'm, I've just got my iron kind of tilted like so, so that the bulk of my pressing is just on that little seam. Just smoothing it away from the quilt. This makes the work of, it feels like there's a pin. Oh, that's my binding pin under there, ha ha. Um, this makes the work of turning that binding and getting it around to the front a whole bunch easier when this side is already crisply pressed in place. And if you don't believe me, try it one way on one quilt without pressing and then try it with pressing on the next one and you'll see how much easier it is to do this next step of turning the binding. It is well worth the couple minutes that it takes. And I'm not even using steam, I'm just, just getting a good crisp press on that. Just go as close to the corners as you can. You can get almost into the corner. It's easy. 
Every so often there are some threads coming through, little fraying threads. I'm just snipping those off as I go, everything that's, you know, on the right side of the, on the outside of the quilt. Last side. There it is. Okay. Now comes the fun part. faux table extension in place again. So now we'll be looking at the right side of the quilt and I tend to start at a corner. So I get it going before the corner and then turn that corner and then I'm launched. And I, I find that the easiest to join when I've done my lap around. Again, you should experiment. So I do usually pin my first couple areas just to um, make sure that it's held in place. If I just start stitching, the binding tends to be pulled in one direction or another. I don't know if all that description makes it clear to you, but I'm trying to give you as many tips as I can about how I actually do it to get a sharp result. Um, so I'll put a couple pins in there. And for the corner, so you recall I trimmed some of the bulk out of these corners and I think this one was the first one I did and I missed trimming it. So I'm going to get a little bit out now because I can feel it. It's so thick and bulky in that corner that it's making a hard lump. I don't want that in the corner of my quilt. So I'm just trimming a little bit of the batting out of there because remember we have two battings, right? So there's a lot of that. Yeah, much better. And I will move your way so you can see better. Let me just do a little more trimming. Just a little more. It's kind of like a haircut, you say, just a little more, just a little more, and then all of a sudden it's too short. Okay, can you see now? I'm just going to lay my binding. I've established it straight here. I'm going to go all the way out to the end of the quilt with it. And I do pin my corners. So I've pinned that first side. It's just extended off the end. And now I will be able to form that 45 degree angle and pin the second side. And I find that I always have to manipulate this a little bit. Like you can adjust because you're dealing with some bias in here. You can adjust where that fold exactly is. If your 45 is not quite right, unfold it, try it again. Fiddle with it a little bit until your 45 degree angle ends right at the point where they're joining. Again, some of my other tutorials will have much better close-ups than I'm able to achieve for you today because I did them in photographs. Um, so another point, and actually I'm going to pause for a second here. Another point, we're going to be stitching on this top side and the bobbin thread is what's going to show back here and it's going to be on the coral on the backing. So I'm going to make my bobbin thread match whatever my backing is. So I'm going to fill a bobbin with coral thread because it is going to show on the back. And the way to make it show the least is to have the thread match. Um, Dave, could you hand me on the second row down, the second, that one, yes, please. And I'll tell you another shortcut that I don't know if it's, um, doesn't matter which one. I don't know if real quilters do this, but this is my quilting thread, my 100% poly quilting thread, and I'm going to use it in my bobbin. I don't know if the quilt police would go for that because I'm going to have cotton thread on the top and poly thread on the bottom, but for my own quilts, I've done this many, many times over the years with no trouble at all. So I'm going to continue doing it because quilting thread is where I have all the colors. I don't have that variety of colors in my sewing thread. That's just me. 
I know some people do. So yay, if you have it in cotton thread, go you. But I don't feel like going out and buying a spool of cotton thread just to do the back of this binding. So I'm going to use my quilting thread. I will take some comments as soon as I get this bobbin started. Hopefully this is not too loud. Okay, comments? Karen, I love this way of attaching binding. Me too. It's, it's really quite speedy. When I'm not doing it on camera and dealing with a bulky quilt, I can whip out a quilt in a very short period of time. Sue, late to the party, miscalculated the time difference. Good grief. Well, you know, the replay is always there. You can go back and see the earlier bits if you want to. Sally, I agree 100% with pressing the binding. So much easier to turn. Mm -hmm. It's just one little thing that takes five minutes and really makes it a better result. Yep, yep, good. Oh, Yvonne, I also press and then use the little butterfly clamps on just the corners, maybe six inches or so on each side of the corner. I love the clamps. No more torches, pin pricks. I hear you. I don't personally have the clamps, so pins it is for me. But I can imagine you would get a lot less pin pricks if you did have the little tiny clamps. So I now have pretty coral thread in the bottom. Just re-threading the top. One of the cool features of this sewing machine, it does not have a lot of bells and whistles, but it has a needle threader. Yay! Which I'm currently struggling with. There we go. All right. Put a few tools away. Clear the decks. Close the lid. All right, and we're going to start top stitching. And again, you guys are seeing a challenging project because dealing with this double batting is a little trickier too. It's there's just a lot of bulk in here under the under the binding going on. Nevertheless, I'm able to feel hopefully you can see that. I'm of course working on this side of the presser foot, but when I'm smoothing this over with my finger, I'm able to feel where the edge of that batting line is, which is basically my stitching line on the bottom. And so to, I forget which of you was asking about how to get this row of stitching neat. That's my best tip for doing it. So number one was to match the bobbin thread because the stitching will fall, to match the bobbin thread to the backing because the stitching will fall in the backing area, not the binding. And then number two is practice feeling that with your finger so that you know that your binding is over but not very far over that seam line. So your stitching now will fall just inside the, the backing area, so just off the binding. So many B words, my gosh, the binding, the batting, the backing. And after I sew a little bit, I will flip up a corner and show you. The stitching line is close to the binding, not on it. In a perfect world, it's in that ditch. In reality, it is seldom exactly in the ditch, so it's just close beside. So I stitch until I have come to the corner and about a stitch with, you know, I, uh, how to describe it. My top stitching is like less than a sixteenth from the edge of the binding. So I go the same width in the corner so that when I pivot on my needle, I'm again just inside that binding. Just two or three threads width. Now I've still got pins in there. My machine is okay with that if I stitch slowly. Um, you might try Yvonne's trick with the clamps. Um, I find that I have to leave the pins in until I get that corner stitched or it shifts on me. And as soon as I get a stitch in the corner anchoring it, then they can come out. After that, I don't pin anymore. So I'm used to the exact width of my binding in relation to my presser foot because I always cut my binding the same width and I always apply it the same way. So you'll kind of have to find your own trim in terms of that. But always as I'm stitching, I'm folding the binding over and then feeling with my fingertips, have I gotten over that seam allowance hump underneath so that I'm stitching on the backing and not on the binding on the wrong side. So let me just do eight or 10 inches so that I can 
at least that so that I can hold up the end and you can see what it looks like on the bottom side. And again, you know, this isn't a race. You'll get faster and faster as you do more. This is still way faster than hand binding, even if you take it slow and careful and do neat top stitching. And it will look so good if you take the time to do it neatly. As always, I will post pictures of the project afterwards and I'll do some good close-up shots of the binding so you can see how nice and crisp the corners are. And I said at the beginning, and I'll say it again, I don't think this is an inferior way to bind quilts at all. If it's sloppy, maybe so, but if it's nice and neatly done, not at all. And it does come with practice. Are we far enough? I think so. I'm not sure how well that shows on camera. Like this? Can you see that? So my stitching is showing on the backing, but not by very much. It's not way out into the quilt, and it matches the backing, and so it's unobtrusive. So that's what it looks like on the wrong side. And that's basically it, folks. I just keep on stitching all the way around. So if you have any comments or questions, now's the time to chip in with them. If you want to tell me how your project's coming along, I'd love to know. I briefly mentioned my new podcast earlier. Um, it launched last Wednesday with three episodes to begin with. And episode number one I did with my sister because we grew up in a quilting family and so I thought it would be fun for us to reminisce and um, just share some of our stories and memories. And we joked that if we were looked at under a microscope, there's quilting thread in our DNA. There totally is. Um, I have quilts in my home made by five generations of women. Uh, my daughter being the youngest. Mother, grandmother, great grandmother. So I come by it naturally. But we also told some funny stories about where we grew up in a remote area of northern Canada and things like that. So if you have a minute, take a listen. I'd appreciate it. Um, leave a review, share, be so lovely. And yeah, new episodes will be dropping every Wednesday. And they're all just interviews with quilters who are telling their stories. Some of them who have businesses in quilting like I do. Others who are makers or it's just their creative outlet. Hopefully all different kinds of quilters. That's my aim. It's not necessarily about promoting businesses. It's just about quilters telling their stories. And what quilting or crafting, there may be other crafts down the road too, but just what that has meant to them in their lives. One of the interesting things about this particular backing by Tula Pink, it's kind of a satiny um, type of fabric. It's just, it's a little bit different. I mean, I think it's 100% content, 100% cotton content. So in that sense, the content is the same, but it's a different feel. So I don't know if it's a different weave. Anyway, it's kind of satiny and it frays like crazy. So one of the things I'm doing as I'm working along here is just making sure all those little bitty frayed threads are stay inside my binding and aren't poking out from underneath. So that's taking a minute of time too. If you find that your binding is wanting to push ahead of your presser foot, this is where the little stylus comes in handy again. I'm not having trouble with that. Remember I put a little bit of tension on that binding so it's pulled fairly snug. So it's not giving me trouble, but different sewing machines handle it differently too. So if that's one of the problems you're having, 
Just use, use your little stylus because you can easily just be tucking that in, tucking it in, tucking it in and avoid having, you know, the binding pushing out in front of you. I think that if this seems a little intimidating doing this top stitching, you might try the clips as well that Yvonne was referring to. They're just like a little a little clamp that opens and they're very miniature. And that might be helpful for you to have an area of it clipped in front of where you're sewing. Then there's not so many things to kind of hang on to and maneuver and manipulate. So by all means, if you need, you know, that's almost like training wheels, but if you need that, absolutely do it rather than fighting with and getting frustrated with trying to hang on to all these bits. It is a bit of a process. You're dealing with the weight of the quilt. In this case, I'm dealing with the thickness of double batting, you know, and all these layers that you're sewing together, plus trying to get straight top stitching. It, it can be a bit much. So many little threads. I'm working in about two or two and a half inch increments, probably only two, that I get folded over and kind of anchor in place with my fingertips and then sew. There are easier bindings than this one. The whole thing nearly fell. Um, you know, on thinner, lighter weight quilts, and so then you can often go a little faster and a little bigger chunks. But for this one, slow and steady is the ticket. Coming up on a corner again, which I know you probably can't see super well, but I am going to employ my pins. So I'm pinning just almost at the very corner with my, um, at the quarter inch seam allowance with my first pin. Then I'm manipulating that miter. This time I got it right the first time. So I've got one pin before the corner and one pin kind of through the corner but after it so that the entire corner is held in place while I'm stitching. And now I'm using my trusty stylus to just hold my binding in a nice straight line under my top stitching. It's pulled quite snugly, so it's wanting to pull away. And I'm just encouraging it. Again, I leave my pins in till I get right around that corner and a few stitches in place where I know things can't pull out. Then the pins come out and on I go. Yeah, let's take a couple comments. My shoulder needs a break. Are we seeing it there? I don't know that it's really showing well, but isn't that pretty? Yeah, it's going to be so sharp. 
Okay. Sally, I never thought of using my long arm thread in the bobbin. That is why I hand sew mine and use the leftover bobbin from the long arm. I just, I wind it and I keep in my sewing machine drawer, actually, I have a bobbin case that's for my regular cotton threads and then I have another bobbin case that has my 100% poly on bobbins because I, I use them from time to time, so I just leave the bobbin there for the next time. Yvonne, double batting is a monster when it comes to binding. Yeah, it does add an extra level of challenge for sure. Sally, love the podcast. I've listened to all three of them several times. Fantastic. I'm glad you're enjoying them. Yvonne, I used to pin the entire perimeter of my quilts and ended up looking like I'd done battle with a mountain lion, scratches and blood. I know it. I've done that too because it's folded and twisted and you, yeah, pinpricks galore. Deb, my Juki machine has a presser foot especially to top stitch the binding like this. That would be nice. I've heard great things about Juki machines. I have never used one myself. That's it. Okay. That wasn't a very long break, you guys. I could have used more comments. Just saying. Back at it. And I'm using my little stylus in any number of ways, like even to coax when my binding doesn't want to go around quite as far as I think it should. I like I actually dig the tip in and just just push it. I just really manipulate the fabric to make it do what I want it to do. I think I probably could have benefited with a hair narrower seam allowance when attaching my binding on the back. I would have had a little easier time with this. I'm, I'm having to force it a little bit to come around the quilt far enough um, to where my stitching line is falling inside the binding on the back. So those are the things that you just learn by experience. I don't do a double batting very often, so that, that little extra bit of loft you know, I should have allowed for that by putting on just a tiny bit narrower seam allowance, and I didn't. But it's working, it's just taking a little more time. In a desperate pinch, if I was not able to get my binding pulled around to where I want it to be on the front, I would actually take a scissors and trim just a little bit of this fluffy edge just to have a little less bulk underneath, and I think I'm gonna have to right where I am now. It's just not quite, it's just not quite reaching to cover over my basting stitching line. It doesn't take very much. Like I'm just trimming little bits of fluff out of there, but just that little amount. Yep, better already. So I may have to do that a few more times yet on this quilt. To some extent, my level of pickiness is dictated a little bit by the project that I'm working on. And I talked about this when I was quilting this quilt. I invested a ton of hours in embroidering the dresses, right? And so that caused me to invest more time into quilting it because I felt that that was the kind of quality that this quilt, you know, called for. Well, it's a little bit the same with binding. Um, I want this to be just right, so I'm taking the time to get my top stitching really nice and accurate. Um, if it was a more casual quilt, I might not be spending quite as much time on that. But I want the whole thing to be high quality. I'm going to do a little more trimming. I will happily take a question, yes. Sue, you may have answered this already. What is the width of your binding? Is it double fold? It is double fold, yes. So it was two and a quarter inches um, to start with. Yeah, this side I really seem to have gotten the seam allowance extra chubby. I'm having a hard time getting my binding all the way around. I will persevere.
I'm sorry about the rustles in the mic. I'm really trying to keep the quilt um, from brushing up against it, but I forget about it sometimes when I'm busy manhandling it. So which of you was binding alongside me and how's yours coming along? some more comments. Um, I do not think I will have a live episode next Monday. Um, I'm airing my little all over feather boot camp on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday of this week. So then I'm going to take a few days off um, from videoing so that I can do some sewing in my PJs. Dave has put the link for the boot camp in the chat if you're interested. So um, if you attended my All Over Feather webinar, it is similar content, the same style of feather and all over quilting. We've just re-recorded the videos and I thought I would try a kind of different format of presenting it where it's broken down into the four days and then there's more time for um, feedback and interaction with students. So if you're interested in joining it, the link is there. They are airing live, but the replays are also available, so you do not have to watch them live. A little more trimming. It is free in case that's one of your questions, in case you haven't heard me say it before. Um, yeah. Currently, quilting the all over feather is one of my favorite, favorite things to do. And actually, you guys can't see Lucy in the camera. She's kind of off angle, but I was in right in the middle of a king sized quilt that I was doing all over feathers on when she broke down. And when I say broke down, I mean she stopped on a dime, blew the breaker, the lights all went out, scared the bejeebers out of me. So the all over feather quilt is still loaded and hopefully by tomorrow we'll be up and running again. Fingers crossed. If you're really listening to your sewing machine, you can actually hear if you inadvertently catch that binding on the back, and I just heard it. I caught it for two stitches. 
So after I've sewn this area, I will go back and look and decide if I want to redo that. There's a good chance I will redo those few stitches because remember I have that corally thread on the back and if it catches the white and green binding, it's apt to be highly visible. So I'll probably go and undo that little bit and redo it. But that's the only time I've caught the binding so far going around. I'm going to trim a little more bulk out of this corner too. Sue Brickman sounds like Lucy had a hot flash. Isn't that the truth of it? Oh my goodness, yes. And we, we don't really know what happened. We know what the result is, which is communications are not getting through from the switches, you know, to the motor. So there's, there's some kind of electrical um, short going on, lack of communication. If only hot flashes were that easy to solve, am I right? that corner number three, pinning the first side. Pinning the second side. Yvonne has a comment. After losing the battle too many times, I now routinely use two and a half inch binding on every quilt done with either double batting or with the minky backing, even though I prefer two and a quarter. That certainly would be an option. I think, you know, as I said, if I had been really thinking it through, I would have done just a smidge um, narrower seam allowance. I think I mentioned when I was sewing it, I do a, a wide quarter inch, a generous quarter inch, and what I should have done is straight on quarter inch. Um, and I think I would have been okay. But yes, that is certainly an option to just use a little bit more generous cut of binding to avoid the struggle that I'm working with here. That's not the neatest corner I ever did either. But already this side is going more easily. I must have just had my seam allowance a bit wide on that one side. This is much easier already. It's amazing how just a few threads of width can make the difference between ease and struggle. My fraying threads from the backing, of course, are pink. So they show up like crazy when they poke through to the front. There is a lot of them. And of course, I did trim the quilt all up smooth on the edge at one point. But now that I'm to this part, I'm just leaving them all in there. I'm just smoothing them inside the binding. They're not going to hurt anything.
Well, I sure appre appreciate you all joining me for this session, which is a little like watching grass grow. Um, and, and for your interaction. So I think it was Charlene who mentioned, you know, using the double pin. Yvonne who has chipped in about clips and things. Um, it kind of illustrates a point, which is that I'm not an expert. I mean, no one of us, I think, has all the knowledge. So, you know, these live episodes are not intended to be the be all and end all of um, the decisive way to do things. It's You're just seeing how I do it. And I love when you all get in there and comment about how you do it because I've learned a number of great things just today, but over the weeks of these lives for sure. I know I keep referring to the podcast, but it is in, in my mind right now. But something that my sister brought up was that the retreats that we have today are so much like the quilting bees of the past. You know, we grew up in um, kind of an Amish country, and so actual, you know, old-fashioned quilting bees were the thing where the women got together all day and brought lunch and quilted all day. And she just, my sister was just remarking that that same feeling of community exists today among quilters and crafters. And we just find our ways. And with COVID, we've found ways of, you know, Zooming and live streaming and things like that. There's always a way to get together and share our knowledge and experience. And I do love that. So thanks so much for chiming in today. And I have to stop. I don't know if you saw that, but the quilt kind of unfolded and dangled off the edge. And right away, I can feel that in my stitching. I cannot keep to a straight line with that weight pulling against me. Coming up on corner four. So this definitely has had an added level of difficulty because of the double binding and therefore an added level of um, slowing me down. I'm having to really go quite slowly and carefully. Generally machine bindings do not take this long. I would say I go at at least double this speed as a rule. So if this is feeling to you like what's the point, you're not saving much time, um, just know that it is not always this slow and finicky. Again, I'm just manipulating my little fold on my mitered corner so that the points, as best I can, exactly, exactly miter. I don't have one slanted off further than the other. That's my goal anyways. I know I'm bumping the mic. I'm sorry. I'm really struggling with this corner to get it to lay flat and smooth. Okay, let's pause for a question or comment or two and I can get me a sip of coffee. Linda, how can I find the still pictures of the quilting on the sundress quilt? I saw them when you first quilted but now can't find them. Also, was there a picture of the center block? I don't remember seeing it. Um, I don't know if there was, Linda. I have pictures. I guess I should just post some. I've been debating whether I want to just do one giant post of pictures or sprinkle them out over time or do a blog post or all of the above. So let's just say I'll get some pictures of the binding today and I'll post a bundle of them. So that will appear on both Instagram and Facebook. Um, so you'll be able to get to see some good photos of that. Linda, I just ordered the Kai Seam Ripper and Scissors. My thanks to those who recommended them. You're one step ahead of me, but I'm going to do that too. 
Sue, I think quilting keeps us humble, so it's a wonderful warm atmosphere when we have the opportunity to share that reality with each other. I miss seeing people in person, humble or not. That is the truth, I, I completely agree. But I will say, maybe for me more than for you all, I'm not sure, but this just feels like a cozy get together, these, these Monday morning lives. Um, I have enjoyed them so thoroughly. Maureen, I copied your quilting around the dress to a quilt I was working on with a butterfly made from an old handkerchief and it turned out beautiful. Thanks for the lesson. Oh, I'd love to see a picture of that, Maureen, because I'm kind of attached to old handkerchiefs too and they're always a puzzle what to do with them. Rose, why do you only pin first corner and not all corners? Actually, I have pinned all the corners. I pin right before it and right after it. And then I sew around it and then I take the pins out. I do pin all my corners. Is that all? Yep. Okay, I'm just going to keep on stitching. We are on the last side here. So the corners are finished. Um, we should be able to just seamlessly meet right up with the where we began. That's the plan. As a little aside for those of you who've been faithful watchers, well, and it might interest those of you who are new too, um, my usual live and unscripted episodes are freehand quilting an entire project, right, from edge to edge. And so when I first began, I did not know that I was going to carry it on. I initially just did a series of four and I thought that was going to be that. But now we've done more and more and more. So on YouTube and Facebook, both, they get a little thumbnail, you know, that uh, is like the front the front cover of a book if you will but it's the cover of the video but they kind of all look the same right because now we've done so many so I am in progress going back and updating those thumbnails to have a picture of the quilt that was being worked on and to also have the name of the quilting design that I used big and bold so that when you're going back to look for them again you can find them and you don't just see all these thumbnails that look alike so hopefully that's helpful too but it does take time so bit by bit I'm going to work through those and then I'll do the new ones as they arrive and uh, so they're much more easily identifiable for you. Can you see this edge here? Can you see all the pink fray? Yeah, you prob probably can't so much. There you go, you can see all the pink frayed threads. That's what I'm just tucking into the binding fold as I go. That's all the backing. It does fray like crazy. At one point when we were talking in the quilting episodes about what to bind with, one of the suggestions was to use the backing, and I did think about that because it's the right color, obviously, matches with the quilt. But knowing that it frays so badly, I hesitated to add that too to this binding, which is already proving to be challenging. Um, to add a highly fraying fabric is just another thing to deal with. So I opted not to do that because I knew that about that fabric.
Oh my word, the threads. Threads everywhere. Little pink threads. And a few black cat hairs thrown in for good measure. Did you guys see the picture of my cat B sitting in my sewing chair last night? A few of you were on live and we uh, are on when we came on live to kind of test this camera location and all of that last night for just a couple of minutes. And of course, he was just right here wanting to know what, what in the world we're doing because we actually shifted um, the positioning of my desk to catch more light and so forth. Anyway, so as soon as I was out of the chair, he was in it. And then I'd have to push him off to sit in it again. It's kind of a comical evening. The end is officially in sight. We are on the homeward stretch. The home stretch, not homeward. We've been heading homeward all the time. About 12 inches left to go. I've arrived back where I started. I'm just putting in a few lock stitches, nice and snug. My thread cutter cuts with tails on the back, so I'm just gonna go cut those tails. And we are finished. Do you wanna, can I put this corner in the camera? Can you see that? See how nice that is from the back, nice and crisp? I just feel like that is a perfectly acceptable and definitely speedy way of binding a quilt. It is kind of dark, but you get the gist. So I will, let me hold it up for you if Dave wants to put the other camera on for a moment. And then I'll try and get some good photographs today of the quilt as a whole and of the binding in particular. And I'll post a bundle of photos. So here's the whole thing. And I think you can see even looking at it there that the binding is nice and smooth on the sides. Very little wavy going on, which is what we wanted. So yay, it is finished. I'll come up closer with the binding so you can see again. This way, there we go. There we go, now you can see it. Okay, sure, let's take a few comments before we go. Cindy, fraying fabrics really irritates me. It takes a little time, but I run a fabric glue stick along the edges. That's not a bad idea to keep that under control. I found it reasonably easy to just tuck them all in the binding and now they're all enclosed and it's not a problem. Sue, when you have a fabric that has so many loose threads, do you ever use fray check or similar? I don't usually on my quilts. I suppose I could. I don't, I just tuck them into the binding. Sally, absolutely beautiful. Enjoy having company while I work. Thanks, Dave, for the great camera work. He does do a fantastic job of that, and I appreciate it because this is not a one-person job, let me tell you. Donna, absolutely beautiful. Thanks, Donna. And Joan, beautiful. 
It's been a fun quilt. Yvonne, it's so beautiful. Susan, a quilting victory for sure. Congratulations. It is really fun to get to the the end result finally. It's probably close to two years since I started embroidering the dresses, so it's really fun to see the finished product. Linda, don't forget a label for this fabulous quilt. Oh, that's a jab, Linda. I'm not much of a labeler, but you've pricked me. I, I will make a label for this quilt. I will. Dave's just double checking if he's missed any comments. I'm grabbing my coffee cup. Ah, I think it's time for a few chapters of a good book. What do you think? Here's another comment, Sue Tinsley. Another Susan. There are so many of us Susans quilting. I finished my embroidered quilt top on Saturday. 602,876 stitches in 100 days off and on, but I have no idea how to quilt it with all the embroidery. Well, I don't know, Sue, if you were here for these episodes. I'm going to assume maybe not. Um, I confess I had a difficult time too finding some ideas for how to quilt with embroidery. My usual idea place is Pinterest and there's not a ton of variety of ideas out there for how to deal with embroidery. So I kind of won it, but I do know that I had seen other quilters, Natalia Bonner was one in particular, who quilted over the embroidery. Because initially my thinking was, how am I going to quilt those dresses and never cross over those hand embroidered lines? And watching her kind of made me realize, oh, hey, I don't have to not quilt over the embroidered bits. And so I did. So if you watched these episodes, you would have seen me do it. If you didn't get a chance to watch them, they are coming up shortly. I'm hoping next week-ish that we'll be re-releasing them. So there's about 12 or 14 hours of recording, raw recording of the quilting on this project. And so we're kind of condensing that down a little bit and that's going to be available again for purchase as a lecture. Uh, Sue Rickman asking when the videos will be available to purchase. Oh, and Dave answered you. Dave's editing this week. So now I have a timeline. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to be put a little disclaimer in there for Dave because we're doing that boot camp this week also, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That's going to take up a lot of time. So I'm going to say it's going to be into next week. So if all goes well, we'll get those out next week. Yvonne, I label all my quilts. It's the first thing my family looks for. I think it makes them feel special. I would love, Yvonne, if you would share some pictures on my Facebook page or if you have Pinterest pins or anything and share them with me, I'd love some ideas. I just don't get it done when I make it a huge and unwieldy project, so I need to find an easier way. Like I know the details. I don't mind hand stitching it on, but you know, to fuss with printing it on my printer and I don't know, then I just don't get it done. So I'd love some ideas for labeling. Mary Rutherford, new word, wong it. <laughs> okay, where did the wong it come from? This said it earlier, I think. <laughs> clearly I said that at some point. I'm sorry. See, this does happen when I'm like focusing on sewing, then my tongue does not always stay in gear <laughs> correctly. Mary is Mary is my sister, by the way, so she, she's allowed to proofread and, and, and that's okay. Sally, Cindy Needham does great stitching on embroidery and vintage as well. Yes, yes, she absolutely does. There are some great ideas there. She does, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but she stitches on a domestic machine. So most of her projects are in a very small scale and very tight quilting, but absolutely gorgeous and a great source for ideas, I agree. Yvonne, in my opinion, the way you approached and quilted your embroidered sections was not only okay, it actually enhanced your special embroidery. That's what I was trying to do, like building, you know, texture and shape into those dresses. That was, that was the goal. And again, I'll post the pictures today. You guys can be the judge, but give me some feedback on that. You know, should I have quilted the dresses more, less, differently? So this was a learning project for me, but a lot of fun. So thank you all for joining me on this journey. It's been great and have a great week quilting and I'll see some of you in the Feather Boot Camp. Otherwise, I'll see you on the next Live and Unscripted. Boot Camp starts on Wednesday morning at nine o'clock. So come if you can. Replays are available to watch too. It is all free, but you do need to sign up in order to have the link and the reminders all um, triggered to email to you. Dave's just talking to me here. Um, yeah, the link is in the chat, but it's super easy. Bootcamp.stitchedbysusan.com. Easy peasy. One more and one more uh, comment, Sally. Yes, Cindy does domestic. Kelly Klein does a lot on her long arm. That's true too. I have not seen a lot of her work. I might go look her up. I am familiar with her name, but yeah. It's always good to have ideas. And if I haven't plugged Pinterest enough, 
I'll just give them one more plug. That is my favorite way to save um, quilting ideas. I used to just screenshot them or something on my phone, but gosh, you have so many pictures on your phone, right? You never, you lose track of them and you forget to go back and look for them or when you want them, you can't find them. Pinterest is the way to go for saving inspiration like that. And if you're wanting to see my work in particular um, on my Pinterest account, which is Stitched by Susan, I keep two dedicated boards that only have my quilting so that it's easy for people to find. So I have a gallery for edge to edge and a gallery for custom. If you quilt for a business, that's a great way to have your pictures in one place for clients to view. So I can just send them to my Pinterest board and say, there's some ideas. So um, that's how I accumulate my stuff. And that's where I store other people's ideas too, like embroidered um, quilt projects. I, that's how I began my thought process for this quilt was by collecting some um, examples of other people's quilting and putting them all on one Pinterest board so that when I went to start quilting, they were all in one place to view. So, okay, enough about Pinterest. Thank you all for joining me and I will see you next time. Have a great afternoon.